Welcome to Science Matters, a series about new developments in the life sciences. Science Matters is brought to you by the Division of Biology at UCSD and its industry partners, and by the San Diego Foundation's Ruben H. Fleet Foundation Fund, sponsors of the Science Matters website, designed for school teachers and students. Please visit this website and let us know what you think. And now, please enjoy the program. So today what I'd like to do <clears throat> is tell you a little bit about how we can use the lowly fruit fly uh, as a tool, a vehicle for discovery in, a, in the field of human genetic diseases. And um, as most of you are aware, the Human Genome Project and genome projects in other model organisms such as the fruit fly have been completed within the last year. <clears throat> and this provides an opportunity now to exploit that information that's provided at the level of DNA to rapidly get insight into the root cause of many uh, diseases in human beings. So I'd like to go over a little bit the idea of what genes are, what the genome sequence means, <clears throat> and then how we might use the fruit fly to address what I think is the key question about the genome, which is how do the genes in the genome actually work? What is it that they do? And so to do that, we have to uh, go back a little bit to what genes are and uh, discuss what it is that can go wrong when a gene doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So the gene is the basic unit of inheritance. And I like to think of it somewhat in analogy to a computer as the digital zero one code that underlies the, the, the fundamental function of the computer. And in that sort of analogy, the basic subunits of DNA, of which there are four, A, G, C, and T, are analogous to the zeros and ones. And they're strung together in a string as are zeros and ones in a computer to represent something. And that uh, sort of minimal unit of representation is a gene. And genes are strung together on chromosomes that each consist of one to 5,000 genes. So the question then is now that we have the sequence of all of the genes and their order on all of the chromosomes is what is it that these genes do? What is one of these unitary um, functions and what happens when its function goes awry as in the case of disease? So for that we have to kind of think of what comes out of a gene. So again, if we think of the DNA, which is the, the sort of zeros and ones, if you will, in the computer, it's the memory as a series of a, in, a, in a very simple form, a string of A's, G's, C's, and T's along the linear length of DNA. And what happens to use that information, as in the zeros and ones of a computer, to say, realize that into a image of your mother or of a sailboat or of a setting, a setting sun, the way you, you get that information out of the DNA is first you copy it uh, into a, sh a short-term intermediate that's very chemically similar to DNA called RNA. And then that RNA gets translated into a sequence of other uh, entities called amino acids that like the A's, G's, C's, and T's are strung together in a linear string in DNA, but now as strung together in protein, they uh, create, there are many more kinds, there are 20 different kinds of amino acids. And unlike the subunits of DNA, which are all very chemically similar to one another, they are often chemically very dissimilar to one another. And then the protein is what has the gene function. And again, in this sort of computer analogy, the protein would be the actual image that you'd see on your computer screen of a sailboat, your mother, or the setting sun. So to sort of illustrate this idea again, the gene that is at the level of DNA is a rather monotonous repetition of these different subunits. So these are like the zeros and ones stored in the DNA. And then 
through the process I just indicated of uh, copying it into an RNA and then uh, into protein, you end up with a complex three-dimensional shape, which is the protein. So again, this is just like the zeros and ones in your computer. This is like the sailboat. And each protein that's made from what looks like a similar uh, appearing strings of zeros and ones is very different because, of course, the orders of the zeros and ones, the A's, G's, C's, and T's, are different for each protein. And so you get some that are globular like this, others that are long and thin to make hair, others that are involved with little motors on the end to pull on each other as you have is pr for proteins that work in the muscle. So the challenge now is what we have from the genome sequence is we have all these zeros and ones. It's like somebody gave us the computer bank information. They showed us all the zeros and ones and now you're supposed to infer from that what the photo gallery really is. And of course, to do that, you'd have to have the program, you'd have to know how it works to translate all that information into functionality. And that's kind of a hard problem. That's a problem that's largely unsolved. And so I think the fruit fly offers some opportunities to helping to solve the problem of now that we know what this is and we can, by the genetic code, which allows us to, to tell what a series of A's, G's, and C's would give us in terms of a series of amino acids, we know that, but what it can't do is tell us what it does. We have to figure that out on a case-by-case -case basis. We do this, and the way we are confronted with the problem from a medical genetic point of view <clears throat> is we're, we, we, we do this from the point of view of mutations that affect the normal sequence of events of going from DNA to RNA to protein. And very typically, in the case of a heritable genetic disease, what's wrong is that there's something wrong at the level of the DNA. So if you remember the sort of general uh, paradigm here is you have DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. And the, the initiating problem in a genetic disease is you have a problem at the level of DNA that then propagates to the level of RNA. And what this could be is that where an A should be, there's a G instead. And now, instead of making the normal protein, there's a defective protein of, of some kind. And one example of that is that the protein just gets uh, chopped off. There are less severe changes where there's just a change in the amino acid that maybe makes the protein made but not quite doing the right thing. But in any case, the, the general idea is that genetic diseases arise as a consequence of mutations at the level of DNA that get propagated to the level of protein that alter the gene function so that it's not acting the way it's supposed to. Now what are the problems <clears throat> in human medical genetics that the fly might help with? Well, the problems in human medical genetics are, in many cases, self-evident. The, the, the most obvious is that, from a scientist's point of view, you have no experimental control over matings. People choose, uh, in this century, uh, their mates for themselves. Um, the other issue, which is, of course, why this is such an interesting and important point to, to study, is that there are many genetic diseases. There are about 5,000, it is estimated, that are simple genetic diseases in the sense that there is a, a mutation in a single gene that leads to or provides susceptibility to a, a, a given medical condition. As we'll talk about in a moment, a majority of these disease genes remain to be identified. So only about 20% of the disease genes have actually been identified in humans. So that means there's a whole 80% that need to be found. And that's a possible place where the fly might help um, also. But again, what I really like to stress is that of the many disease genes that have been found, <coughs> a lot of them, the function of them is unknown. So for all practical purposes, they're just a series of zeros and ones, and we don't know what picture they would paint. So if we ask what is it that we could use the fly for, the first question that must come to mind is, well, does the fly even have genes that are like human genes? Is that true or not true? And overall, the answer is yes. So about, if we just take every gene in the fly and every gene in humans, there are about 60% of them are in common. So uh, that's just the sort of overall picture. But as I'll point out in a moment, show you in a moment, we've conducted a, a more detailed analysis of the human genes that are known to cause disease. And we've looked at the fly counterparts of those genes. And what we find is that you know, what's, what's known, what's previously been known by the work in the medical genetics field, is that there are about 1,200 of the 5,000 uh, human disease genes have been identified. And they've been identified in the sense that the mutation that causes the problem has been found. So that they know that the gene in this form is normal, and a gene that's aberrant in a certain way causes the human disease. And that's true for 1,200. Uh, of course, that still leaves 3,800 to be found, but <clears throat> that's true for 1,200 of these. Now the question is, 
how similar are these genes to genes that are present in flies? And the answer is, is that 75% of these disease genes are related to a gene in flies. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that those genes are carrying out the same function in flies and in humans, although 30% of them are so closely related to the fly that one might guess that this is likely. Okay, so 30% of human disease genes have a gene in a fly that is very, very similar to them. And I'll give you a little bit of an example of that in a moment so that you see what I mean by similar. And then the other thing that's, that's worth pointing out is that the disease genes that have counterparts in flies, those, those diseases aren't just one kind of a disease. So it's not like we're just looking at a disease in the formation of a specific structure in fly that's a little bit like a structure in humans. Rather, they fall into all the major categories, heart diseases, um, neurological diseases, uh, metabolic diseases, immune compromised functions, the whole gamut. And as I'll mentioned in a moment, the reason this is likely to be the case is that the most recent common ancestor of humans and flies had all of these tissues in them and had all of these functions, we believe. And as a consequence, during the course of evolution, these functionalities have been maintained. And for example, flies have a primitive heart and the formation of that primitive pumping heart has been, was that heart was present in the common ancestor of humans and, and flies and the formation of that structure in, in flies still still follows in its, in its course the early courses and steps of heart formation as would be seen in, in a vertebrate, even though the vertebrate then goes on and builds on that rudimentary structure. So the big question I think that's fair to ask about this is that we can say that there are genes in flies that are very, very similar to human genes, but what inkling do we have that they actually c carry out similar functions? That's a very legitimate question and it's one that's troubled us a great deal. And the answer is until we really study these genes one at a time individually, we won't know how many times, how often it will be the case that we will be able to make a good argument from the fly to, to the human. But what I'd like to give you briefly here is summarize some evidence that suggests this is extremely likely to be the case. That is that the genes that we find in flies that are similar in their sequence to human genes most of the time are going to be carrying out similar if not identical functions in flies and humans. And one example, there are many others that I could give, but one that I'll focus on because it's, it's in the general area of research that, um, that I'm interested in, in in other parts of the lab is that of development. And if we look, for example, at the formation of an embryo, the creation of pattern in the embryo from a fertilized egg. So as you know, you start off with a single cell fertilized egg and you end up with an animal that's got a nose, a tail, a belly, a back. Um, in the case of a vertebrate and also a fly, you've got legs, you've got a heart, you have eyes. How does that all happen? And that process has been intensively studied over the last two decades. And what we know is that the system, the genetic system, the genes that are involved in distinguishing the nose from the tail um, are in common between flies and vertebrates. And in fact, the most famous experiment of this was performed by Bill McGinnis, who's also in the Division of Biology. And what he and others showed is that normally there are these genes that are involved in this sort of colored scheme here in determining specific regions of the body axis from the nose to the tail. And it turns out that there are, there are counterparts to all of these genes in flies in vertebrates and that you can identify based on the sequence of the gene which vertebrate gene is most similar to which fly gene. And it turns out that if you, for example, take this gene in red here uh, from a mouse or a human and you put it into the fly, that it can substitute in its function for a fly that lacks its own red gene. So that's an example over the uh, probably six to eight hundred million years of evolution that has separated vertebrates from invertebrates, the degree to which there's been conservation in the functionality of these genetic, uh, of these genes. It's as though you could take a carburetor from a Volkswagen and put it into a Mercedes and have the Mercedes work very well. And those cars have only diverged within the last century of evolution. And these rather go back six hundred to eight hundred million years. And this is true not only for the anterior posterior axis, but also for the genetic system that dis along the dorsal ventral axis that distinguishes tissue types, the nervous system from the skin, for example, um, as well as the development and induction of photosensitive organs or eyes. 
as well as the creation and formation of appendages and the patterning of the top and bottom halves of the appendages. So what we can do by these genetic similarities is sort of reconstruct what the common ancestor of vertebrates and invertebrates must have been. In addition to this, we know that it had a primitive, or it had actually a, a well-developed immune system of a certain type, um, which we also have, that's involved in fighting bacteria, a very efficient version of a component of the immune system. It had, as I said, a heart, it had a gut, it had um, uh, the mechanisms to make the nervous system hook up properly that is in common with the with with vertebrates and invertebrates that are uh, existent um, today and there's even some evidence that the genes that people have identified in flies that are involved with the rudimentary learning that flies can do it's they're not the world's smartest animals but in fact they can exhibit a modest uh, degree of, um, of learning and we can look for mutants that don't do that and it turns out that if you knock out those equivalent genes in a mouse the mice too are learning impaired so it looks like we can build a picture of a sort of shrimp like creature that was a highly evolved creature and this was the common ancestor of both vertebrates and invertebrates and what that means from a medical point of view is that anything that we can imagine that most was most likely present in this common ancestor any gene that carried out a function at, at that level is likely to still be ex exerting similar functions in vertebrates and invertebrates and therefore the invertebrate system the fruit fly is a very valid organism in which to investigate the functionality of these genes and I'd like to make a um, a bit of an analogy here about genes and, uh, and sort of molecular machines. So genes don't work in a vacuum. The proteins that we, we look at aren't just isolated pictures of sailboats or grandmothers, but rather what they really are is their components in little molecular machines. So that each thing like the crank, these gears, the pulley, the chain, the bucket, each of these things would be, in, in this analogy, would be a gene. And these genes aren't just working all by themselves, but what they're really trying to do is they're trying to pull this bucket up with some water in it. That's what the function, that's what they're doing. So they're interacting with one another. They don't act in a vacuum. And that's presumably why they haven't changed much during the course of evolution. Because once you've made an, a machine like this, well, if you now start making this gear, instead of having little uh, protrusions coming out of it, be round without protrusions, and you want it to do something like a roller system for engagement, well, then this thing has to become a roller too, and then they have to become pressed together. Well, that doesn't happen very easily during the course of evolution. You take this gear and you make it round, the thing just doesn't work. The animal dies. So as a consequence of genes being components of molecular machines, they haven't been able to change much during the course of evolution, and that is one of the reasons we believe why there's such a great degree of conservation in the sequence of these genes and in their functionality. Okay, so um, I'd like to then, with this analogy, consider a couple of the, the uses of the fly and why um, we think we can uh, learn a lot about these molecular machines, which the idea would be is that this little machine is present underneath the, oh, the, the apparent dissimilarity of a fly and a human. It's right there underneath at the functioning level making, the, making the, the, or the fly or the human being work properly. So both flies and humans have very, very similar versions of this machine, although they're doing different things in the, in the final analysis. They're being used, these little molecular machines are being used to do different, do, during different things. In the same way that a focusing um, gadget that would be involved in, in focusing a camera, a little motor, might be very similar to a motor that would be used um, to tune a laser, but the motor that's tuning the laser is tuning a laser, not focusing an image in a camera. Yet the little machine might be a machine that you'd buy from Radio Shack that could be used to, for both purposes. So these little molecular machines are what have been conserved during the course of evolution is the argument. And you can tell that this is the case in many ways because the way you figure out, it's kind of like a mechanic, the way you figure out what the machine does is you ask what bad thing happens when the machine is broken. Okay, so what happens, for example, if you take out gear one, is you can't lift the bucket. The machine is broken. And you can infer that there must be a gear one and gear two working together, because what you find out is that if you knock out gear two, the same thing happens. The bucket doesn't go up. So you knock out any component of this machine completely, and you get the same result, a broken machine. 
And because the defects that are manifested in these broken machines that are visible, for example, as specific neurological uh, conditions, cardiac conditions, are so well defined that you can tell that they must be working in the same little molecular machine because the defects are all the same. You have a cardiomyopathy, for example, where the heart just simply can't contract properly. It's different from other cardiac diseases like conduction diseases in which what happens is the heart can contract but you can't, one ventricle can't communicate with the other. So you can distinguish these little molecular machines that must be involved in creating different aspects of our functionality and by virtue of the components that when taken away break the machine, you can sort of reconstruct what those components must be to make the normal machine. Now the other thing, which is perhaps a little more subtle, but is really the great advantage of the fly in model genetic systems, is the following. Is that what you can do is you can come up with a, with a machine that functions, but just barely. So for example, imagine that gear one is worn, not removed, but worn. Now this machine is working, it pulls the water up maybe more slowly, but it does it. But then, if in the background of this situation, you reduce the function of any other component, like you have a worn gear too, now the machine is broken again. What is nice about this is that what we can do in flies is we can create a fly that's the equivalent of this barely functional machine. So that it's not normal, um, but it works enough so that we get a fly that, that comes out that we can see. But all we have to do is reduce the, the function of any other component in the machine. Any of these other components. We weaken any one of those other components, as in the case of introducing a worn gear too, and now the machine is broken. So now what we've got is a fly, is a, is, a, is a system that is sensitized to any further problem. And using that as a tool, by searching for other mutations that aren't crippling mutations on their own, which is kind of harder to do, but just simply redux, reduced in, in act activity, um, which is much easier to do, we now can look for genes that, are other, that encode other components, that produce other components in the molecular machine. And that just simply cannot be done unless you have a, a model organism with a very rapid generation time through, for which you can look through many, many progeny um, to, uh, to, to analyze. And model organisms like the fruit fly um, really are the only possible solution other model organisms like mice have great advantages, they're more similar to humans, but they can't do this, you can't use them for this purpose very easily. Okay, now I'd like to get in here and say what is it that we did in trying to look at this problem and how have we actually gone about thinking about how to use the fly to study uh, human diseases. And the, the, the sort of first part of this was a collaborative project that we carried out um, with Michael Gribsko over at the UCSD Supercomputer Center. And um, what we did is we asked for all the human genes that are known to have um, defects in them, what genes are there that might, uh, what, are there any genes that are like that in the fly? So I, I mentioned that we already knew that information, but that came from, from this analysis. And so as it turns out that in this most recent iteration of this, there have been, there are 1,224 human disease genes that have been identified, and <clears throat> if we ask, uh, at a certain statistical level of confidence, which is very stringent, is there a, a gene that's related to that in flies? The answer is yes, 74% of these 1,224 genes have a gene in flies that is clearly related to them. Now, it doesn't mean that it's the exact counterpart, but again, um, it means that, it's, that it, it, there's a gene that is carrying out a similar function. And for 30% of them, the similarity is so high that we believe that it's very likely that they are indeed acting as the similar little gears in those molecular machines. So what you can do with this database that we set up is you can print in a disease name or um, a keyword that uh, is relevant to a, a problem that might happen in a fly if a gene was knocked out. And you can try to make links between disease conditions in flies, I mean disease conditions in humans and defects in one process or another that are known in flies. I'll just give one very quick example here. There's a gene called um, Angelman gene, which is the Angelman uh, syndrome gene, which is one of the genes we're actually studying in the lab. And if you type in the word Angelman and follow it through, 
This is a list of sequences of genes in flies that are related at, to some level um, to the human Angelman gene. And what you see is there's a little color scale here. This means the most related. This means just a little bit related. And what you see is that there's only one gene in fly that is highly related to the human Angelman gene throughout its entire length. There are other proteins that are related a little bit just in different parts. And there are others that are even related quite a bit, but just over part of it. But there's only one gene in the fly that is highly related to it throughout its entire part. We think this is the fly version of the human Angelman gene, and therefore it could be studied as a unique gene in flies uh, for the, to understand the function of the human Angelman gene. If you look at this a little bit more and say, well, what do you mean by similar? It kind of gets back to that question of what we're talking about. This is the human Angelman protein, uh, a piece of it, just a small piece to illustrate the point. Um, this is the, the fly uh, uh, version of it. In red are the amino acids that are absolutely identical between the two. The blue ones are ones that are very similar, and the black ones are ones that are not terribly similar. And you can then make a sort of consensus or, or uh, describe those that are amino acids that are matching or similar. And what you see is that most of the amino acids are the same in flies and, uh, and humans in this region. And this is a representative region of the protein that I've chosen. Um, there's some places where there's just similar residues that are present. That, For example, these are kind of oily ones. These are kind of charged ones. Um, and there's some of, there are a few places where, where they're different. So clearly these genes have changed somewhat during the course of evolution. Not too surprising given 800 million years of time. But what you see is the remarkable degree to which this, the, the sequence has been conserved. Okay. So what are the best genes to study in the fly? What can we do to make the best use of the fly to, to study human diseases? Um, for example, of those 1,200 genes, let's say three to 400 of them are highly related to a fly gene. Um, so um, what do we do then among those to sort of figure it out? Well, the first, of course, that I think it makes just simple common sense is that it's best to use the fly to answer a question for, wh for which there is a question. That is, if the human disease gene is well understood, its function is well understood, there's not a great advantage to using the fly. But again, this is not typically the case. The typical case is that the gene function is not understood. It's got a bunch of zeros and, and ones, A's, G's, C's, and T's, but the activity of the gene is not well understood. Um, as I mentioned, I think another uh, good thing, at least uh, for starters, is that the human disease gene has a fly counterpart which is very similar to it. So it's in that 30% of genes that are very related to human genes. Now, of course, that's not a fixed number, and so there's a little bit of fuzziness there, but it certainly helps that that, that would be the case. Not an absolute necessity, but it's a good idea, I think, to start off with. And then there's a, a pragmatic issues, like the gene should be relatively straightforward to analyze in flies, and I don't want to go into that, but there are reasons in some cases where it's easier than others that have to do also with that database, that, um, that, that homophila database that we generated. And, but the important thing that I think distinguishes what we've been doing in the past as a field using model genetic organisms, because there's a rich history to the, uh, to the genetics of Drosophila and other model organisms, is that in the past what people have done, and I think this is totally legitimate, and I'm very grateful to the NIH for funding this sort of idea, is that you study a process in a mechanistic level in a simple model system. And thereby, because the model system offers you the ability to do that, you probe it to this, a level of detail and resolution that you could not possibly do without access to such a model experimental system. And then because you have that knowledge, you now are in a position to um, make better guesses about how processes uh, work that might underlie con biologically important things that are relevant to humans, like disease. And as a consequence of this sort of general way of organizing the, the sort of science, uh, what we typically do is we take a model organism like a fruit fly, and we identify an interesting problem to study, and we make an argument when we write our grants that this is a process that is uh, relevant to the human process because, for example, there is a counterpart to the gene that we're looking at. But all we really want to do is, in the proposal is study the function of that gene in the fly and hook it into the known genetic elements that are acting in the fly. So we study, in the end, we study the fly for itself, but hope, and it's not a vain hope, but we hope 
that as sort of fallout from that, there will be technological spin-off, as you, as, if you will, that will be beneficial ultimately to the human medical condition. And that's right. I think that's an excellent thing. I'm glad they do that. And it's a very insightful and visionary uh, uh, sort of organization that they've uh, set up that way. But what we're proposing is to do something far more direct. That is, we, we propose to use the fly as a tool to, explicit, to answer explicitly questions in medical genetics. So for a moment, we're putting aside the fly as an interesting entity in its own, and we're simply using it as a tool to answer a question. It becomes now a black box and is simply a conduit from uh, where we are to where we would like to be in terms of knowing something about human disease. So as a consequence of that, this sort of way of thinking about it means that we have to have a particular problem that is plaguing the people in the field of medical genetics, come up with a scheme in flies to answer that question, and then in the end of the day have an explicit test in humans that tells us whether or not we have succeeded in our attempt to use the fly to answer a question that's relevant to medical genetics. Now this is something that uh, Larry Ryder, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, uh, who has a background in medical genetics, and I have been um, sort of formulating as an idea, and as of yet, we don't have any direct uh, uh, completion of what I call closing the loop, that is, solving a problem in medical genetics using the fly as a tool. But we have begun to look at that, this problem at an experimental level, and I'm just going to very briefly describe some of these ideas because they illustrate the, the concept of closing the loop. So, here are three examples, and by no means exhaustive examples, of how to close the loop. I showed you an alignment of the Angelman gene. It's one of the genes we're studying in the lab. The Angelman syndrome gene, when mutant in humans, causes a very severe form of mental retardation and other uh, neurological complications. The Angelman gene itself is, by, its, by the protein product it encodes, is an enzyme that is involved in adding uh, tag to specific proteins in the cell and when this tag is added to a particular protein in the cell that protein is then destroyed. So the function of the Angelman gene is to identify specific proteins in the cell whose levels must not go beyond a certain threshold uh, level and when they do it adds this tag to them and it destroys them. So the inference is, is that in a mutant, in people who suffer from Angelman syndrome, the problem is, is that these proteins that are normally supposed to be tagged for destruction are not, and therefore are present at unusually elevated levels. So the idea, and uh, Larry and his, his students have, uh, have accomplished this already, is to take the Angelman gene in flies, which again is very, very similar to the Angelman gene in, <coughs> in humans, and knock it out. Knock it out not so that it's completely gone, because when it's completely gone, the flies are dead, but to knock it out in the sense like I showed in the molecular machine slide, where the gear is worn, not completely absent. So now you've got a fly, that it, it dies, but it dies, it just barely dies. So in this case, if you look at the, the, at the level of the, the machine, it's a machine where you've just filed the gears down enough so that it doesn't quite work. And now the idea is, is that in this case, the reason it's not working is that there's something in the fly that's present at levels that are too much. There's too much of something. So if you secondarily reduce the levels of that problematic protein, the target that is normally being degraded or destroyed by virtue of the Angelman, normal Angelman gene function, if you reduce the levels of that troublesome protein, now even though the gear is worn, you might be able to lay, risk the, uh, lift the bucket. And in, in that analogy, you could just say there's less water in the bucket, so it's easier to raise. So this is an example of where we think we can really exploit the powerful genetics of the fly to identify the possible target of the Angelman gene, which if we could identify it, could be a target for therapy. The enzyme that's involved in targeting that protein for destruction, that is the Angelman gene itself, would be the worst possible target for drug design because if you made a drug that interfered with its function, you would collaterally interfere with the function of all other genes like the Angelman gene that function by targeting other proteins for degradation by putting a, t a tag on them because they all work very in a, throughout a very, through a very similar mechanism. So what you really want is the gene that is causing the trouble. 
That's the thing that would be the potential gold mine as a target for therapeutic intervention. And the fly might help us find it. That's the idea. <clears throat> In the case of the, this disease called primary congenital glaucoma, the problem is, is that the human eye, very early during the development of the eye, fails to create a, a region of the eye which in the, in the mature eye drains liquid from the eye. So there's a cycle of liquid that goes on inside the eyeball at, where the liquid is produced and then drains out that keeps the liquid uh, clean and allows you to see nicely. But in, the, in primary congenital glaucoma, the drain for this little uh, cycle of liquid is plugged and so the eye swells up and ultimately results in um, blindness. Now it turns out that although that's true, Worldwide, and there have been many, many mutations found in this gene that cause the same defect, there is a group of Saudis in which you have family members that have this condition, that are blind, and they'll have siblings which have the same mutation, but are not. They're unaffected. And genetic analysis of this in humans has, 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 has determined that there is a gene the identity of which is not known, but it maps somewhere to the short arm of human chromosome 8. So it's like 1 50th of the human genome or so that they've narrowed it down to. And in that region, there is the, a gene that confers resistance to this disease. That is, you can have this disease mutation, but you will be unaffected. Well, that's kind of interesting to know. What is that gene that confers resistance to this otherwise blinding disease? really would like to know that. So we have a collaborator, Basim Bajani at Baylor School of Medicine, who has been studying this and has the DNA from the Saudi family that have affected and un unaffected individuals in them. And the question is, is can we use a fly to find this gene that is interacting with the gene in primary congenital glaucoma? And I'll talk about that uh, again in just a moment. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the final um, category, which in the end may be one of the most important uses of the fly, although it's very straightforward, is that as I mentioned, 80% um, of the genes that cause disease in humans have not yet been identified. And through that little molecular machine illustration I, I, I gave, the idea would be is that if you had one component of the machine that was crippled, like that gear one, you could then use uh, the genetics of the fly to find mutations in the other gears, in the other components of that machine that reduce the function of that machine. And thereby identify pot potentially other genes that cause a similar uh, defect. Alzheimer's disease is one good example of this. There are um, believed to be many different genes which when mutated can give rise to familial forms of Alzheimer's disease. Only two of those have actually been identified. A, a gene called presenilin and a gene called beta amyloid. But there's several other loci that people are quite convinced exist that are not mutations in those two genes. What are they? Well, the idea, again, is to get a, a, a fly that has mutations in genes or alterations in genes that are the, com are the counterparts of these Alzheimer's genes. And both beta amyloid and presenilin genes are present in flies. And then search for other genes that interact with those using these little genetic, um, these genetic tricks. So, I'll just give you one example of these three, which is the primary congenital glaucoma, as how we think we might be able to help address this sort of problem. So again, the goal is to identify the human gene that confers resistance to primary congenital glaucoma in those unaffected Saudi individuals. They have siblings that have the disease that are just as bad as anywhere else in the world, and yet they should have the disease by all, uh, by all analysis of what their DNA is at the, at the level of this gene, and yet they don't. Why? Okay, so the, the thought is, is, well, first of all, let's create a fly that has its, the counterpart to the PC gene, and there is one, uh, knocked out. So that's actually what, one of the first things that Larry did when he, he started working on this project, is he made several different mutated forms of the fly version of the primary congenital glaucoma gene. He made one version where the gene is basically completely non-functional. And when that happens, the fly is very severely affected, but occasionally some flies, most of them die, but occasionally some few flies live. And then he also made another uh, mutant version, which I'll show you in a moment, that has physical abnormalities. 
then the idea is, is you take, for example, the first one, where almost all the flies die, but a few make it. And now you look for compensatory mutations, mutations that would be in other genes, other parts of the molecular machine, that <clears throat> allow the fly to, to live. Because presumably, there's some damper, perhaps, in the normal machine in humans, so that if you get rid of the damper, even though you don't have a functioning uh, PCG, PCG gene, you get back to somewhat normal function, because you've restored overall activity of the machine. So the idea is, well, the flies could have a similar damper. Maybe we could find that damper in flies. And now the question is, now that we think we have found a candidate you know, dampening gene in flies, is the human counterpart of that, that new fly gene that we've just found, is that the one that's conferring resistance to primary congenital glaucoma in humans? Okay, so we ask, we, we screen for mutations in flies that rescue the lethality of, of the mutation of, of mutants that have a defective PCG, PCG gene in flies, and we ask whether those genes, which we can then identify in flies, whether counterparts of those are genes that, for example, as a first indication, map to the short arm of human chromosome 8, and if they do, are those genes altered in some way in humans? And so what we do is we identify such genes, and then ask our collaborator, Basim Bajani, to sequence those genes or analyze those genes in humans and ask, is there a variation in those genes in humans that might account for the, uh, 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 the ability of those people to uh, do without a normal PCG gene? Okay, that's the, that's the idea. And so here's what primary congenital glaucoma looks like. It's this condition called bupthalmus. This is a child that's probably at about the age of two that is blind. This is a serious thing. This is not a subtle or irrelevant uh, issue. This is something that really causes anguish in human beings. So now we start off here with a wild type fly. It doesn't look anything like a human, of course. And we look, as I said, there are two different kinds of mutants that Larry found. First, he found ones that reduced the, the, the ability of the fly to live at all because he basically knocked the gene out. And then he got others that were more or less the filed down gear, the worn down gear version, where he gets a fly. And again, it's not so much that there are defects in the eyes of the flies. The eyes are normal. But what you see is that its belly is all bloated. So it's got a swollen belly, just like the human has a swollen eye. In addition, the wings are not inflated, and the way a fly develops is that when it comes out, it pumps liquid out into its wings to make its wings extend. That hasn't happened here. So there's a problem in fluid flow in the fly, it appears. There is a problem of fluid flow in the human in, the, in this condition. Now, are these the molecularly, are the little molecular machines that are controlling the hydrostatic pressure, perhaps, the same in flies or human? We don't know that yet, but the idea is, is that so many other examples have proven true where the genes function in similar sort of molecular machines in humans and in flies. If not in this case, then in others we hope that we will be able to make links like that. And Larry has in fact found, um, and, and, and people working with him have, have screened through over five or hundred or a thousand mutations in flies asking for things that make the, the mutant fly better. They found a dozen or so. One of them maps to the short arm of chromosome 8. And indeed, Dr. Bajani is at the moment um, analyzing the structure of this gene in, um, in, in his uh, patient sample DNA. And we hope by strategies of this kind to make a direct closed loop between the fly as a tool and understanding something about human medical disease. So I leave you with this uh, reflection is that when you look at a fly, see your own reflection shining from the past, lighting the future.